Okay, so I think we've dealt with our questions, um, and we'll dive into um, metabolite identification and quantification. Um, so we're going to look at um, essentially, and that's to pick up what I was emphasizing in this last couple slides from the last module, which is um, quantitative metabolomics. Um, call it targeted, it's also untargeted, but it's still quantitative. So we're going to learn about spectral deconvolution or assignment, and um, we're going to use it both for NMR, for GCMS, and then also LCMS. And then we're going to look at uh, a very variety of mass database searches and, and, and databases. So the goal in metabolomics is to go essentially from spectra, whether it's GCMS, LCMS, NMR, or whatever, to lists of compounds and their concentrations. And the concentrations can be relative concentrations or absolute. My own preference is to have absolute concentrations, and, and that's certainly a growing trend in the field of, of, of metabolomics. So historically, the problem with metabolomics was it was lagging behind the fields of genomics and proteomics. Uh, if you had a genome sequence, uh, you could very quickly either translate the genome to protein sequence uh, or proteome sequence, uh, and then you could just do a blast search, and you could basically identify uh, all of your genes and proteins. It, 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 uh, would, you know, sequence alignment, sequence comparisons, could identify functions, the names, all kinds of things. And this is something you could do in a matter of minutes. Um, in the world of, of proteomics, if you've got uh, MS spectra and um, MSMS data, you can submit your unknowns to the mascot server and very quickly get um, protein identifications. So software, public software, has existed both in the world of genomics and proteomics for a long time to identify your unknowns. You know, submit a sequence, submit a mass spectrum, get your answers. In the world of metabolomics, uh, for a long, long time, there just wasn't that tool. Basically, people would go to the library, pull out books published in the 1960s, and compare their spectra to whatever, and then hope that they could find what they were looking for. And so that, uh, that's been an issue uh, with metabolomics, and probably one of the reasons why it was the last to sort of join the triumvirate of, of omics. The, um, we're going to essentially in the next bit show how that's now changed and show you some of the tools to do that. But um, I think there's also this issue of, of what's now become the unknown, unknown problem. And it's partly picking up from, from uh, Donald Rumsfeld, if people might remember his quote. Uh, there are known unknowns, that is to say, we know there are some things we do not know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. Um, anyways, um, in, in the case of, of metabolomics, there's lots of situations where the peaks are there, and so the moment we see them, I can't really tell from a retention time or even just a collection of mass M over Z values or chemical shifts what the compound is. But by submitting it to uh, a database, um, these databases or software tools actually can identify them because they were previously identified. They sit in a database, so they've gone from being unknown to known. But then there's the more challenging ones, which are compounds that, yes, you've identified or you've collected spectra from, but they match to nothing in any of the, the known databases. The mass doesn't match to anything. The NMR spectrum doesn't match to anything, the retention time doesn't match to anything, or, or combination of all those threes. And so, in those cases, um, for the unknown unknowns, you have to actually, have to use uh, computer-aided structure eluc elucidation or case methods, which are something we'll briefly talk about. But what we're looking at is mostly the, the known unknowns. That is, there's someone, some point in history has actually identified, purified the compound, collected the spectra for it, and so it's your task really just to see if it's in this particular biosample or not, and what its concentrations may be. 
So for those known unknowns, we do either something called spectral deconvolution or spectral assignment. And so you're doing, all you're doing is matching peaks to a known set of peaks from pure compounds using a pre-compiled database. So someone's had to collect these pure compounds and run literally thousands of spectra, tabulate them, put them online or in books, uh, and make them searchable. But that's been done and it's being actively pursued and, and, it, and it works for NMR, GCMS, LCMS, and MSMS data. And so that identification of the known unknowns is what I call quantitative metabolomics. People can call it targeted, but it's also untargeted because um, in the case of NMR and GCMS you're not really targeting. So that's the theme for today, at least for Module 2. So in the case of metabolite deconvolution by NMR, this is essentially what you're doing. If you're given a mixture, which is at the top, uh, and, and if I had shielded off the other components, I, the question is, you know, is that mixture one compound, two compounds, three compounds? If you look at it, there's, I think, six spectral clusters and say maybe it's six compounds. Or if you think in the world of GCMS, you might say there's 20 odd compounds. Well, what you can see is, in fact, that top spectrum is the sum of three spectra from compound A, B, and C. And not only can you see that it's a sum, but you can also get a, an estimate of the concentrations, that compound A equals compound B in concentration, and compound C probably also equals compound B in concentration. So there's three equal molar concentrations of three different compounds. In some cases, the spectra peaks overlap. They have exactly the same chemical shifts. In other cases, they are unique. So this is relatively simple to do with three compounds in a simple mixture. It's much more difficult to do with 50 or 100 or 1,000 compounds in a complex mixture. But that's the challenge. Now, there are tools and software programs that actually allow you to do this. There's a company called Konomics, which is based in Edmonton which allows you to do spectral deconvolution with NMR. Um, and the software itself is something you can download uh, and, and run it for free, at least for a month, I think. Um, so it allows you to manually process the NMR spectra. So this is where you do the Fourier transform. You convert the, uh, what's called the free induction K into a, an NMR spectrum, then you phase it. It will with the software that they have, you can remove the water signal, which is usually very, very prominent in an NMR spectrum. It'll perform baseline correction, which is something you have to do with MS and LC and all kinds of things that you also have to do with, with NMR. It'll do some referencing, so it identifies the chemical shift. It'll normalize the peaks. Again, you have to do that manually. And then you fit the spectra. So you'll take the, the reference spectra and you say, I think this peak looks like, you know, leucine. So you pull out the leucine peak and it's done with a mouse click and it will fit that and then you can shift it around. And it's actually very easy to learn and to use. And in past years we would actually teach people how to use that. But we found that it was taking a long time. And in fact, the tendency is that it takes about half an hour to even an hour for a person to fit a spectrum that's maybe relatively simple, that has maybe 40 compounds. And if we had 30 of you doing the fitting, we would get 30 different fits. Even though it's the same compound, same mixture, same solution, just the tendency for people doing different, different styles of baseline correction, different styles for um, uh, fitting and phasing, all of which can lead to misinterpretation. However, there are other tools. So Brooker has uh, software system called Amix, not really as friendly or as usable as, as the Konomics one. But there's some automatic tools. Um, Brooker has developed a, an entire NMR system and software, that sells for about a million dollars, for analyzing juice. And then you can get another one that will analyze wine. And these will automatically identify um, the compounds in juice samples and in wine. And there's about 40 compounds that these can identify. There's a tool developed by Tim Ebel's group at Imperial College called Batman, which uses a Bayesian method to automatically assign or characterize NMR. 
uh, spectra. And Batman typically um, will take about 8 to 10 hours <laughs> for a sample mixture of about 20 compounds. So it's not exactly fast and not really amenable to a course like this where we've got 30 people. So uh, what we'll talk about and show you in the lab is, is a tool called Basil, uh, which is developed um, in my lab in collaboration with uh, Russ Greiner in computing science at the University of Alberta. Why do we want to do automation? Well, um, it's fast. So instead of 30 minutes a sample, you could potentially do it in one minute per sample. Um, and it's consistent. Um, so it's, it'll give you identical results regardless of, of um, what sample is, is, is done, and it'll do exactly the same all the time. So if it's wrong, it'll make the same mistake every time. But if it's right, it'll do it correct every time. Um, obviously, if you've got hundreds or thousands of spectra, it's something you can leave uh, on your own. You don't need teams of people staring at spectra working on computers night and day, which is actually happening. Um, and because it's a computer, it can also see signals that sometimes are not obvious to us, uh, unless you're a real expert. So that's there's one of the real strengths, or many of the real strengths with automation. Yes? Um, generally, what you want to do with the Konomic software is start with the original FID. Um, because the processing that Konomics expects you to do, um, you know, it guides you through that. And, and it actually does a really nice job. In fact, it generally does a better job than the NMR instruments themselves. Um, it has a much better baseline correction, much better phasing and, and water uh, suppression than, than the instrument software. So um, it's, it's just best to take the FID, and that makes the FID the, the, it's somewhat independent of, of what someone else has done to it. All these fittings are done in 1D? Yes, this is all 1D NMR. Uh, there are some tools that allow you to do um, analysis with 2D. Um, and uh, uh, the problem with 2D is it's not quantitative. It's, so it's good for identification, but peak intensities vary considerably with 2D NMR. And, and um, um, so that's why we're focusing on 1D here. I, I mentioned Batman, and, and so you can download the program. You can install it. Uh, Jason here has spent much of his life <laughs> trying to install it and, and trying to run it. Um, uh, but, you know, some, some cool ideas. Uh, it's just incredibly slow. Um, so we'll, we'll be using Bazel today. Um, and what's nice about Bazel is it's actually web-based. So you don't have to download and install. You don't have to have an operating system. So all of you, I think everyone now has web access. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you should be able to do it. Uh, we've, we've tested on many samples. We use it in, in my own lab, uh, which is a core lab. So we've looked at hundreds of samples. It's, it's quite accurate. It uses uh, what's called probabilistic graphical models. Uh, and most of you have never heard of them. Uh, it's like a hidden Markov model, which some of you might have heard. And it's, these are things that are used commonly in, in speech recognition. So if you've ever used speech recognition like Siri or anything like that, those use or analyze spectra and look for identifiable patterns. And that's how Siri or other speech recognition tools recognize words. Here, we're just making it try and recognize compounds. But it, it's a similar type of problem. It functions in an inferential way. So it, it, it uses inference techniques, um, which is what humans also use when they fit. And we watched how people would fit spectra. And so that's sort of embedded into Basil. The reason why it works is, and the reason why it's successful even for humans to fit complex spectra is they have to know what the spectra is. is. So is this of blood? Is it of urine? Is it cerebral spinal fluid, saliva? Is it hemolymph? Is it plant sap? If you know what it is, you also have a good idea of what its composition is, give or take about 10 compounds. And so if you have that prior knowledge, 
which is where this Bayesian concept comes in, then it helps with the fitting. It, it makes it a convergent problem. What we've also done with Bayesil is we've made it fully automated in the sense that it automatically phases things, it automatically gets the chemical shift reference, it automatically removes water, baseline corrects, and then it does all the deconvolution. By taking that away from the human, it gives it consistency. And that's critical, especially if you want to move this sort of thing into the clinic, which is one long-term plan. Um, if you can make things automatic, um, then you can move it into essentially general practice for, for things like screening, for industrial work, or for clinical work. So these are some examples of where basal has fit uh, some compounds and spectra. The description of basal actually just came out a couple of weeks ago, so we had to sit, submit the slides before that came out. But um, anyways, um, you can see how complicated things can be, um, but you can also see how well fit is. You can compare the green line to the black line, or the red line to the black line. And um, this is what Basil's able to fit. Here it is working on cerebral spinal fluid, and uh, in this case, the fit was a human. Expert took them about 45 minutes, and you compare the red to the black. Lots of peaks. Uh, there's about 45 compounds. Uh, basal on the web server uh, for the same sample would take about five minutes. If we were running in parallel or a really fast computer, uh, it would take just a minute or less. So the website, and this is actually, I guess, the, the reference for the paper as well, um, is very simple. Uh, it was actually designed by Jason Grant, who's with us. So if there are any problems, blame him. Um, and so there are sample spectra you guys will be doing in your lab. You'll actually be uploading spectra and, and it'll be processing and analyzing these things for you. But it's an example of, of I think, the trend that's already happening in metabolomics is that things are moving more and more towards automation. Um, because in some respects, why waste your time identifying compounds when really the interest is what do these compounds do or mean? What's the biological interpretation? What, what do they? You know, that's why you have your graduate degrees, or that's why you're pursuing your graduate degrees. So there is a trend, whether it's through software or through kits, to try and make metabolomics, at least the compound identification part, simpler, faster, more robust, more automated. So. If you're operating Basil, you, as I say, click on either example and, and press submit. And what you'll see within the first five seconds is it will take the, uh, what's called the free induction decay, or FID, and do a Fourier transform of that. So it converts it into a spectrum. And that's what the spectrum looks like initially, which is really awful. Um, so it's got peaks pointing up and down. So that's called a dephased spectrum. This is what a lot of NMR spectra look like. It has a giant water peak, which covers all kinds of things. That's the thing in the center, because we're collecting the sample in water. So that's after five seconds. About 15 seconds later, it will have started phasing. And so now the peaks that were all upside down are now right side up. And that giant water peak that was sort of giant unfazed thing is now mostly phased, um, and so it's starting to look like a pretty good NMR spectrum. And then about 30 seconds later, it's now uh, got a completely flat baseline. It's now properly referenced. The giant water signal is completely removed. Um, so all the baseline correction, phasing, reference correction, peak deconvolution is now done. So about 30 seconds in all. And then over the next three to five minutes, it's going to try and identify every single peak in that spectrum. And this is what it'll produce. Um, so you'll see, um, again, a, a spectrum which you can use a variety of tools to zoom in. And it will display, uh, and you can just barely see in the figure, there's a blue outline of what it's fit, and a black, which is the actual spectrum. And I think you'll see that just about every peak or every peak is identified there. So five minutes, it's done what would have taken you guys probably an hour uh, to fit. 
uh, using manual things. And then if you scroll down a little further, it provides you the list. It gives you a list of the compound, the HMDB identifier for the compound, the concentration for the compound, and the confidence score. So confidence of 10 means it's absolute certainty that the compound's there. 9, very, very certain. Uh, 5 says we're not that sure. Um, it could be there, it could be not, so it might be worthwhile looking at it a little more in detail. And I think anything below 5 is, is considered probably not there. So it's a web server, um, so it can't do everything for you. Um, and so what it currently allows you to do is to look at serum, plasma, and cerebral spinal fluid. And that can be from humans or rats or any mammal probably even fish and frogs and lizards too, but um, that's because these have largely the same, same composition um, or expected composition. It doesn't work for urine, it doesn't work for plant sap, it doesn't work for wine or juice. Um, and that's because you have to collect the reference spectra for that and it's not trivial. Um, it doesn't work for every kind of NMR, so it doesn't work for 400 or 700 or 800 or 900, um, but it works for the common ones. Uh, if you are going to be using it uh, outside of this course, um, you should be really careful that you're preparing your samples exactly as described, and this is essentially in any analytical technique you have to follow a protocol. And I think what we found when we put this on the web Almost immediately, I'd say 90% of the people didn't bother to read the protocol, and so they'd be uploading anything <laughs> and complaining that it wasn't working. Um, so again, it, you know, it helps to read. Um, so right now it's in a single spectrum mode. You guys are going to have the privileged opportunity with a bulk spectrum uh, anal analysis that Jason has spent a long time working. Again, if it doesn't work, blame him. Um, so that's what we'll see in the lab. So I'm going to switch now to metabolite identification by GCMS, which is a little different. Um, so in GCMS, recall, we, we separate by gas chromatography. And then, as I said, what you'll find is that typically under any given peak, if you're lucky, it might be a single compound. But more often than not, it may represent two or three or ten compounds. So what we can see is we've taken this little peak and then we blow it up and we can see, oh, it's actually the sum of three peaks. And within each of those three peaks, um, we kind of get mass spectra. And in some cases, the mass spectra aren't exactly totally pure, but hopefully they're um, a little purer than others. So you can kind of deconvolute which ones are belonging to the red compound, which ones are the black compound, which ones are the, the green compound. Once you've got those spectra, these, these are the electron impact or electron ionization spectrum, then you look up a database. Uh, and the database would have pure compounds, uh, MS spectra collected under identical conditions, 70 electron volt fragmentation energy. Um, and you would compare and you'd try and match them. And you can see if you look at the, you know, the red one very carefully, you'll see that it matches the one that's circled and the blue one matches the one that's also circled, and the green one matches the other one that's circled. And so now you've identified the three compounds. Even though they had basically the same retention index, they had three different spectra, and so now you've identified them. So, uh, as I say, the, the, the reason why that's possible is because, at least with electron ionization or electron impact ionization, these compounds fragment in exactly the same way if you put them under the 70 electron volt um, potential. So that's why it's reproducible. Uh, if you used 65 electron volts or 100 electron volts, you get very different spectra and so nothing would be identifiable. So again, follow the right protocol. So what you'll typically see is with a, an MS spectrum, um, you normally would just see the, the parent ion or the molecular ion. So that's the compound with its, uh, you know, molecular weight plus one, if it's an extra hydrogen. Occasionally, if there's uh, a gas uh, in there, you may have an adduct forming. So you actually can see a peak that's actually of higher molecular weight. Uh, in this case, it represents an additional chloride ion that's been added. And then on the lower molecular weights, 
closer to the y-axis, you'll see a whole bunch of other peaks. Um, those are the fragment ions. That's where all the information is. Because with GCMS, the resolution is very low. It's typically one Dalton. Um, so it's not enough to identify a compound by molecular formulas. But the fragment pattern has all the information. Now the intensities don't tell you a whole lot, but the positions do. Now the other thing you also have to remember in most cases as well, GCMS compounds are derivatized. So they'll have uh, trimethylsilane, or they'll have methoxine derivatives, or TBDMS derivatives, and sometimes they'll be decorated at two or three or four different places. And so you will have increased masses, and so instead of seeing an adduct, you'll see a TMS derivative, or a double TMS derivative, or a triple oxine derivative, whatever. So the masses that you'll get from a GCMS and the parent ion don't necessarily correspond to the pure original compound, they correspond to the derivatized compounds. So for this one, if the compound actually had six derivatizable amine or hydroxyl or acidic groups, you could end up with six different groups or six different peaks, actually, uh, all with different masses. So one compound, six peaks. So NMR um, is typically used to identify hydrophilic uh, compounds, uh, water-soluble compounds. GCMS is also pretty good at identifying hydrophilic compounds like amino acids, very good with organic acids. Um, also very good with fatty acids, which you can't generally detect by NMR, or cholesterol in some cases. It has a mass limit, so typically compounds less than 500 Daltons. So you're not going to detect really big molecules or large lipids with GCMS. As I mentioned, GC chromatography is, is higher resolution, higher plates, better reproducibility as well than LC. The other thing that's happened with the GCMS community is they've standardized everything. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened with the LC or LCMS community. So that still allows the EI spectra to be very comparable. The way that most people do GCMS work now is to take, uh, to use a combination of a software tool called AMDIS and a database called the NIST database, the National Institute for Standards database. So I'm not sure if NIST is up to version 12 or not, but this is version 11. Um, so it has hundreds of thousands of spectra, of electron impact spectra. It also has other ion trap and QTOF and triple cot spectra. Um, but because things aren't so standard <laughs> for um, those methods, um, they're not, the NIST database isn't as useful as the EI database. And there's also retention index values uh, for about 20,000 compounds in the NIST database. So remember what I said is that retention index values can actually be used to identify or at least narrow down what a compound is. This is what the searching software looks like. Uh, it's something that you download and, and install usually on a Windows machine. And you can see the, the mass spectra. Uh, you can see compound lists. You can see uh, scores. Um, probability matches. Um, so it's quite informative, um, and then you can see how the, the spectrum up in red matches the spectrum down in black, which is, again, another visual cue about um, whether you've got a, a matching compound. So essential to how NIST works is this um, um, software tool, processing tool, called Automated Mass Spectral Deconvolution and Identification System, or AMDIS. So it does what Basil does for NMR to some extent. It tries to identify the background noise. It identifies the peaks, so it does peak picking. It does a spectral deconvolution, pulling out the peaks, uh, the mass peaks from the, the GC peaks. And then if you've connected it to the NIST database, it will do the compound identification using a scoring technique called the match factor, or MF. So it's measuring the similarity of the peaks of your query to the peaks in a database. So it has a formal mathematical definition. So it compares the intensity and the mass 
of each peak, and it scales it by a factor of a thousand. So it's essentially a dot product, if you remember linear algebra, and it's scaled. So if you get a perfect match, perfect match factor will give you a thousand. And some people will divide it to express it in terms of percentage, and others will express it as just a number from zero to one. But the way that the match factor officially was calculated is it was a perfect match was a thousand, and an imperfect match was zero. So if you're trying to do GCMS and you want to both identify and quantify and identify by retention index as well, you need to have a bunch of external standards. So usually the standards are, are alkanes and they usually stand, span from octane to hexadecane. And so this can be used to help determine your retention indices, calibrate your retention indices. And if you actually know the exact concentrations, they can also be used to help um, help calibrate a little bit with the quantitation. Generally you want to do um, a blank sample, uh, which is, allows you to identify peaks that might be arising from the solvent or the derivatization agents or stuff that's still stuck in the column. Um, so blank is, is, is really good to have and it's something that you often subtract the blank from your spectrum. So you've got your calibration standards for retention indices, you've got your blank sample, and then you run your sample of interest under the same conditions that you ran your blank. So this is what your external standard for the retention index uh, calibration would typically look like. So uh, you've got eight or nine peaks there, you can see they're nicely separated, and you now can scale everything so you get very precise retention indices. So with that retention index or an alkane mixture, you can start standardizing things um, and create a calibration file. And that calibration file with, with AMDIST and NIST calculates retention indices. And then you can start searching the NIST database for those matches. Um, you can also start comparing against the blank uh, compound just to make sure you're not identifying any false positives. So if you're running AMDIS, you can create a calibration file. This is what a calibration file will typically look like once it's run. Uh, then you can calibrate when you call up the calibration file. So that changes all the retention times to retention indices, so RT to RI. So now everything's kind of normalized, and you can use the retention index information to help confirm an identification. And then you can start searching the NIST database using the software that they have. So here you're seeing a, a peak, and there might be, in this case, three or four possible compounds. And then by clicking on the peaks, the red peak, the yellow peak, uh, the blue peak, uh, which is this curve, then you can see what the mass spectra look like. Uh, so this is for 11.597 minutes or retention index, and you can see what, what's corresponding to the peak. Um, and you can see the location, um, you can zero in. So here we're looking at the peak, which is marked in the big red box. You look inside and you're seeing a yellow, a red, and a blue that sum to the observed peak. Uh, and then you can look at the masses and you can look at the match factor. And you can see that under this peak, um, we've got a good match factor, 84% or 840, uh, and it matches to Valey. Um, there's maybe another peak which is weaker, uh, or another set of compounds, and that, that may be something other. So you can use the NIST or AMDIS approach, um, so, but there also is an automatic approach we'll talk to you guys or show you guys later called GC AutoFit. Uh, instead of the AMDIS tools, people have developed other tools, commercial ones, Analyzer Pro from Spectralworks, Chromatoff from Leco. Uh, and these are compared, AMDIS, Chromatoff, and Analyzer Pro, four or five, well, six years ago now. Uh, there's also other databases other than NIST 11, NIST, I don't know if NIST 12 is out. Um, there's a GOM database, which is in the Max Planck Institute in Germany, or one of them. Um, and then there's the Oliver Fien has produced a, a semi-commercial library as well. So... A lot of the things, the processing 
techniques that are done for AMDIS and NIST can actually be automated. So we've actually converted that to a, an automatic tool called GSUA AutoFET. So it's a, a web-based tool like Bazel. It still means you have to collect some reference specs. You have to collect the sample, you have to collect the blank, and you have to collect the alkane standards. But it does the reference uh, retention index sort of fixing. It, it um, does the peak identification that AMDIS does. It does the peak integration, which MDIS doesn't do, uh, to get your calculation and concentrations. It takes a bunch of different files. It's quite fast, much faster than Basil, and it, it's able to identify quite a few compounds. It doesn't work for everything, but it works for mammalian, blood, urine, saliva, and CSF. But if you don't follow the protocol, it won't work. And so that's another lesson or reminder. So this is a quick outline of how you would run or prepare GCMS files. Um, you would have your alkane standards, and you can label them um, depending on what format they're in. Uh, you'd have a blank file format, and again, you can label it whatever you wish. And then you have a set of sample files. So if you're analyzing a bunch of runs, 10, 20, or 30, you can upload those. Um, you can do some conversions, uh, NetCDF and MZXML are the required ones. Um, they have uh, tools that can do that conversion software uh, that's either downloadable or, or associated with other instruments. Once you have those files, if they're the sample files, they might be zip files, or you can upload them one at a time. Um, so you identify your alkane standards, browse, select, blanks, files, browse, select, sample files, browse, select, and then you also need to choose your database. Um, so the database is the library that again is working with um, what you think you're analyzing. So if you're going to be analyzing blood, don't upload the cerebral spinal fluid library. If you're going to be analyzing urine, don't upload the CSF library. Um, so there's different types of libraries and there's certain types of standards that you can choose to help um, with the calibration, identification, and quantification. So here you've got your choice. In this case we'll be using an internal library. Uh, we won't be using your own because I don't think any of you brought your own library. Um, but it's a library that's internal to the server and in this case we're choosing urine and in this case we're choosing our calibration standard of cholesterol which is allow, allows us to quantify things. Once you've uploaded things, you can just double check to see your alkane standards, see if they look nice. You can look at your samples, see if those look decent. Uh, and then it crunches away and kicks out a, a list, not unlike what you saw for basil, which is um, a collection of peaks and retention indices, and what the compounds are, and then it annotates them. And you can view them using a viewer similar to what uh, Basil has. You can also save the files as a CSV uh, table. And then, of course, you can view them as we've just seen on the spectral viewer. So that's an automated form of, of GCMS. And we'll, we'll run through that as well. Now, it's important, whether it's NMR, GCMS, or LCMS, just to be aware of the different levels of metabolite identification. So, in, in most cases, what you're trying to strive for is what we call a, a level 4 or level 3 le identification. So these things are positively identified. Um, so in that case, it often means you have to have the authentic standard in your, in your hands and compare it. Or in the case of NMR, if the NMR spectra, because there's so many peaks, match, then you can be quite certain that that's the compound. In the case of um, GCMS, again, if you have a high number of, of both matches to the uh, fragment pattern and the retention time, then you can be probably put that into a level four. But if you're just trying to match the, only the parent ion mass, or a parent ion mass and, and a retention time, then it's a little more tentative and it would be a level three. Uh, that's where a lot of people do or leave things. And I think this is an unfortunate situation that's going to uh, lead to many problems. So a lot of people identify compounds purely by mass matching and just to the parent ion. 
that's a very weak identification, and I would put it more at a level two. Um, and more often it's wrong than right. So if you want to positively identify a compound, we strongly suggest that you either identify it by a, a robust method like NMR or fragment ion matching by MS um, that's been coupled with retention indices or retention times, or you use the authentic standard. So level one is sort of the unknown, which is a feature or an unknown peak. And again, that isn't terribly useful for um, writing up or thesis or a paper, but in metabolomics there are lots of unknowns, and so it's still worthwhile identifying them as, as unknowns. So LCMS um, is very similar to GCMS. Uh, if you remember the picture I showed for GCMS, these are identical, uh, but conceptually it's the same thing. If you want to be able to look at um, what's under uh, an LC peak, several compounds uh, are typically there, several spectra may be there. They might not be as complex as the ones I'm showing here, uh, unless you're doing MSMS. Um, but even with soft ionization, you'll get some fragmentation. So there's a number of commercial tools that people can use. Um, Agilent, Mass Hunter, Thermos, Sev, Progenesis for Waters, Profile Analysis for Brooker. But there's some freeware that's available. XCMS and MZMine are the two that are most commonly used. How many people have ever used XCMS? Two. Okay. How many have ever used MZMine? One. Okay. Two. Or... So, um, anyways, how many have used commercial software for LCMS metabolomics? One, two, three, four, five. Okay. So, um, anyways, that's uh, neither here nor there. I just wanted to know what, what, what people know about. So, we're going to be learning about XCMS online. And um, XCMS was a downloadable program, it still is a downloadable program, and it was one of the first open source tools for mass spectral processing. Uh, so you can download XCMS, you can run it, um, and we used to offer a, a little lesson on how to do it. It does peak picking, peak matching, retention time alignment, but now, instead of a program, it's available as a server. And servers are always easier to use than downloadable programs. So we're going to use the XMS Online, which is the server. Accepts a wide range of formats, uh, much more than the than GC Autofit, um, because it has to deal with all the different manufacturers, and they haven't been able to agree on, on formats yet. Now, in XCMS, it doesn't do metabolite identification, or at least not in the way that we'd like it to. Uh, but it is linked to a database called the Metland database. Um, which you'll have an opportunity to use or explore. So this is outlining how the XCMS or XCMS Online works. It basically takes a large collection of LCMS data. It'll get the extracted ions, uh, chromatograms, um, and because retention times and retention indices in LC are not very uniform, not like GC, they have to be aligned. So they have to do things like what's called non-linear alignment or time warping alignment. So they'll shift and adjust peaks so everything matches. Once all those spectra, which barely aligned initially, are fully aligned, then you can start basically running XCMS. And that's when it starts identifying peaks, it starts um, separating them, starts measuring you know, approximate amplitudes, separates signal from noise, and so on. Um, and it will generate a whole bunch of M over Z measurements. Uh, from there, you can also, if you run a tandem MS spectrum, you can also pull those out from that. And so from either the mass spectra, if they're accurate masses, or from the tandem mass spectra, you can compare them to the Metlin database or the HMD database or uh, other databases to identify your compounds. In terms of peak detection, uh, it'll try and sort of combine peaks uh, from the extracted ion chromatograms. It'll do some filtering to make sure the peak is well detected. Um, so there's a fair bit of processing. Uh, just like with NMR, you can see that the peaks are not always pretty, um, um, but peak identification is critical. 
This is an example of what the alignment and retention corrections will look like. So initially, if you're running the same sample, in this case maybe six or seven times, you'll see that just from the drift on the column, the peaks will be coming out differently. But in this case, it was exactly the same sample, so they should have come out exactly overlapped. So what, what the uh, XCMS software does, along with any other commercial software tools, is it will do this time warping or nonlinear alignment so all the peaks are, are matching up. It'll make the appropriate shifts. In some cases it's just a simple linear addition, in other cases it's, it's sort of a, a stretching out that actually occurs. So before and then after. So XMS is compared to a bunch of different tools, SpecArray, uh, XAlign, MSInspect, NZLine, and, and um, in terms of, this is published a number of years ago, but overall it has, or had, the highest precision in recall. All the other tools are obviously in their second and third iterations, so they're doing quite well. So they're all doing pretty well in terms of identification. So if you want to use XCMS, you could download it, but today we're just going to be having people uh, sign up and use the online version. Now, unlike Bazel and um, GC AutoFit, which are pretty fast and only run on a single CPU, uh, XCMS is very compute intensive and runs on a very large compute farm. Um, so the scale of MS processing, data processing, is much more difficult computationally than it is for NMR and GCMS. This is just a very quick one. I'm not going to go through this in, in detail because you guys are actually going to see this in the, in the lab, but it's just you know, go to the website, create a job, upload your data, upload your spectra, um, there's a couple of selection steps. Again, you guys can refer to these slides uh, to actually run it. Choose your parameters that are functions of the type of the platform that you're using. We'll, we'll tell you which one you're supposed to be using, but if you're running mass spec, um, they have pretty wide range of, of, of platforms that are supported. Then you submit, and then it'll give you a, a status update and report how far things are proceeding and whether it's ready to be viewed. Um, so it's not instantaneous, not one minute, not five minutes, but I don't know how long for the samples today. It might be 20 minutes. We'll see. We'll see if we can bring the whole system down. Um, once you've got the processing is complete, then it has some wonderful uh, spectrum um, and, and views uh, which allow you to explore things in a little bit more detail. But what you're mostly interested in is your peak list table, which in this case lists the uh, masses, the retention times, the intensities, which give you a relative measure of, of quantity, quantity. Um, not really a precise measure. Um, but that's, that's the, the ultimate thing that you're hoping for. So whether it's Bazel, GC Autofis Fit, or uh, XCMS online. All of them produce a list of metabolite names or identifiers, in this case M over Z values, um, and relative concentrations or absolute concentrations. So in LCMS, um, not all the peaks are real, so peak picking is never perfect. The intensity is only relative. So these are not concentration values, but they still are useful for doing uh, statistics. The peaks aren't identified with compound names, so you still have to do some annotation after this. And so that can be a little challenging, and that's where you use separate software or use tandem MS data to do some matching and comparisons. So we've talked about what, how NMR is good for water-soluble compounds. GCMS is good for um, organic acids and amino acids. LCMS works well for lipids, for bases, for fatty acids. Generally better for hydrophobic molecules. To get solid identification to go for, to that you know, level 2 to level 3 or even level 4, you need retention time information, you need MSMS -MS data, you need accurate MS data, and ideally you need internal standards. So although LCMS gives you lots and lots and lots of information, 
and it allows you to identify many potential compounds, it's non-trivial to get absolute quantitation identification. So, you know, that's be warned. It's, it's appealing, but not simple. So how do you identify these compounds? If you've got your masses, um, accurate masses, um, there are searches you can use. So you can search through a database called KEBI, Chemicals of Biological Interest. PubChem, which has 30 million compounds, of which only maybe 0.1% are actually natural products or metabolites. So a common mistake many people make is they just search through PubChem because it's the biggest database. Well, you're also going to get some pretty strange hits that are not at all biologically relevant or correspond to compounds that were, have never left the laboratory. There's ChemSpider, which is sort of the British equivalent of PubChem, um, a very interesting database. And then I mentioned the Human Metabolome database, which is mostly restricted to human or mammalian metabolites, but actually covers a fairly large swath of metabolome space, uh, even for plants, because people eat plants, and so plant metabolites end up in the human metabolome. So uh, here's the PubChem search. Uh, you can search by molecular weight ranges, um, and it'll give you hits, and list these. So if we typed in this range from 89 to 89.099, uh, we get 408 hits. You can browse through to see if they seem realistic or reasonable. Kebi, you can do a molecular weight search. Again, these are mostly biological molecules, but they also include pollutants and drugs and a few other bizarre things. And they cover mammals and plants and bacterial and, and fungal metabolites. Um, so there's a macuate search there. Now you can also do more sophisticated searches, not just with molecular weight searches, but actually with MSMS or EIMS spectra. So this is where you're not just putting in the single molecular weight, you're putting in multiple peaks. So these are the fragment ions. So we've already talked about the NIST database. I've mentioned the Metlin database. Uh, I'll mention a couple of other ones that are also useful. So, you know, they, they do the trivial molecular weight search, but they also support looking for positive and negative ion searches. Uh, they can also search for the neutral mass. They can do things like adduct searches as well. They can do MSMS searching. So these are much more useful, as a rule, um, for metabolite identification. So one tool that we've developed is a, a database um, that you can search and compare MSMS spectra. Um, it's calculated or generated MSMS spectra from all the compounds in the HMDB and all the compounds in KEG. Um, the prediction tool is very accurate, and so you can try and see if it matches any of those searches. Um, and uh, that's one way of identifying by, by mass uh, spectral or fragment matching. Uh, you have three options. You can have an option where it will just take a compound and predict the MS, MS spectrum, but another option where it will do the compound identification. And for our purposes, that's probably of, of greatest interest. If you've chosen that, then you can enter the mass values, the intensities. Uh, it has an example that you can use and once you've entered that. Then you can enter at high energies, medium fragmentation energies, or low fragmentation energies. That's up to you. It's a function of the, the type of mass spectrum you're, spectrometer you're working with. Once you've submitted it, then does a cal uh, comparison calibration, then it outputs the, the hits, and you can see the, the spectral matches um, with the blue and red lines. So, as I mentioned, with mass spectrometry, um, you'll often get things that are uh, fragments or adducts. So you can get neutral loss species, multiply charged species, chloride adducts, sodium adducts, potassium adducts. In fact, 80% of the peaks that you'll see in an LCMS spectrum are actually from these so-called noise sources. And it may even be higher than that. So the challenge then is to try and 
um, get rid of these um, fragments, distinguish the adducts, the multiply charged species, as well as the isotopes uh, for higher resolution mass spectra, and to group them together. So this is an example, we saw it with chlorine and GCMS, but this is with sodium and ESMS. So the actual parent uh, mass of this compound is 951 Daltons, but you'll see another peak above it, which is 973. And so if you're just trying to do mass matching and you didn't know there was an adduct, you would enter 973.287 into Metlin or HMDB or PubChem, and you'd get a hit, but you'd be matching the wrong compound because you didn't know that it was a sodium isotope or um, adduct. And so adducts will form on you know, negatively charged um, groups, nitrile groups, sulfate groups, um, anything that, uh, that has a strong negative charge. So people have created tables, Oliver Fien and others, uh, of the types of adducts or masses that you'll see that you should generally look for. And so, uh, by looking for pairs of peaks that are separated by 45 Daltons, 17 Daltons, 28 Daltons, 12 Daltons, and so on, um, you can identify things that are either adducts or singly charged or doubly charged or triply charged groups. And so you can see from just a single compound, it's possible to end up with many, many different types of peaks. And that's why there's so many of these sort of, quote, noise peaks that can be confounding and confusing. Oliver Fien has a very nice list of, of adducts, very comprehensive one. Um, as I said, whether the adducts is also the neutral loss fragments. These are spontaneous fragmentation events that will happen in, in EIMS. Um, and... Um, uh, they'll create peaks, so these are sort of fragmentations that you'll, you'll see. Uh, so you may not have done MSMS, you've just simply done a direct injection, but you're simply seeing these extra peaks, and this is just because things break up. So different tools, uh, databases, online servers, Metlin, NZDB, HMDB, handle and predict adducts. Uh, they're also able to predict dying pairs, multiply charge piece, Metlin handles neutral loss species. Um, so if you're only searching by MS and you didn't worry about neutral losses and addicts, you're going to end up with lots and lots of mistakes, lots of false positives. So the software that people use, um, and it's partly embedded in XMS Online, but a lot of other things is you want to remove and consolidate your adducts and your multiply charge species. You want to remove and consolidate your fragments, neutral losses, the breakdown products, any rearrangements. You want to remove and identify isotope peaks, that's called de-isotoping. And you want to remove any noise peaks from the sample blanks. Um, so this is why it's always important to run a blank or to check to see if the replicates, the technical replicates, um, don't show dilution. So those are all indicators of just random noise that's showing up. So these are all the things you have to do to clean up. So if you had, say, a, a positive mode spectrum and you're getting like 15,000 features, well, if you remove the addicts, it's down to 12,000. So if you remove the multiple charged species, you're down to 10,000. If you remove the neutral losses, you're down to 8,000. If you remove the isotopes, you're down to 3,000. If you remove the noise, you're down to 2,500. So you've lost factor six. So the final spectrum might be 2,500 peaks that are real peaks. And even then there's other issues that might not be that they're real compounds. And then you'll do the negative ion mode. Generally with negative ion mode you don't get as many. Um, and so the tools that help you with that are things like MZMine, there's a tool called Metfusion, Magma is, is, is another one, as well as commercial software. We're not going to have time in these uh, sessions for you to get familiar with these and to, to, to process them. But again, I want to impress upon you that as, as rich and as sensitive as mass spec LCMS is, it's a lot of work uh, to get compound identifications to sort the noise from the real peaks. And, and, and it's not particularly quantitative because we're just talking about these relative peak in intensities. Can you talk about de-isotopy? 
So when you get a mass spectrum of a compound, you'll have its uh, molecular ion and so on and all of its isotopes. So is it basically saying if you don't have isotopes, so not considering you as a compound? Um, or does that, is that very software dependent? No, what it's doing is really you're trying to take the, if you've got five or six isotope peaks that are visible, then you just want to consolidate them, not treat them as six peaks, but treat it as one peak. Um, but then the denoising issue is saying, okay, if, I'm, if I've got a very sensitive spectrometer um, and I'm not seeing any isotope peaks for this, it's probably noise. It's, so that's another way of detecting the noise. But again, it's a function of how good and how sensitive the spectrometer, the mass resolution. Um, so, in some cases, de-isotoping isn't necessary because you don't have the resolution. So, I know I'm kind of plowing through this. We've got a lot of material here, but um, um, we've covered a lot. <laughs> um, but um, we're just trying to highlight the, the different protocols used for identifying compounds, one for NMR, one for GCMS. And you'll notice I'm spending most of my time on LCMS, in part because it is very complex. So, again, the, the strengths of mass spec uh, are that it gets a lot of information, but you can also, with the best instruments, highest resolution instruments, get a lot of information to help identify compounds. Um, so if you can be absolutely confident that you've got the parent ion mass and you've been able to measure it to 0.1 ppm, you're well on your way to identifying the compound. So if you've got that high resolution of, of you know, millidaltons, you can use molecular formula generators, where you just put in the mass, so you know, six decimal places, and uh, out will spit uh, a molecular formula. Uh, so one example is a, a web tool called MZDB, uh, maintained at Aberystwyth in, in Wales, and they have um, tools for generating molecular formulas. So you just type in your mass. Uh, obviously, your mass tolerance is usually much smaller than 0.2 Daltons, and it will generate the molecular formula. If you've got your molecular formula, then you can do searches through PubChem. So molecular formula is more useful than the mass, because if you've got um, a formula, then you can be, you know, there, there's, there can only be one chlorine here. It can only be six carbons. It's not where you're trying to get um, you, know, you can rule out compounds that have fluorine or, or nitrogen or whatever. So you can go a little further where if you look at not only the isotope peaks but the isotope abundance as well as rules about chemical bonding restrictions and presumed atomic composition data. So generally if you're looking at you know, mice and rats um, they don't take fluorinated drugs, um, they don't take brominated compounds, so you can exclude fluorine and bromine and other things from being in there. Um, so you can actually reduce the number of, of matches um, quite a bit. And this is something that was developed by Oliver Feen and group called Seven Golden Rules for Formula Filters. So you can take the accurate mass, but if you use some of the other things like isotope intensities and um, consistency for bonds, and valence, constructs, everything else, um, you can narrow things down quite a bit, um, both to the type of the formula and the possible structures. And this is sort of shown here back in the early days when PubChem was much smaller, but you could have you know, uh, well, 8 billion possible compounds with elemental compositions less than 2,000 Daltons, and you can end up with uh, from those 8 billion, about 600 million compounds that uh, are highly probable using the seven golden rules. And then if you look at um, PubChem's 10 million compounds at the time, then it, it reduces it to much smaller. And then if you exclude PubChem or the, the synthetic compounds, then you're basically left with about 50 to 100,000 natural compounds. And so this highlighted also the utility of, of actually working with databases that were largely with natural products rather than, the, say, the PubChem database, which covers anything that's ever been synthesized under the sun, 99.99% .99 of which never has left a lab, therefore will never be in any organism. <laughs>
this is another plot that came from Oliver's description, just showing that the large number of molecular formulas that you can come up with um, based on the masses and mass ranges. And, and uh, obviously, as you increase the mass, there's going to be uh, more and more possible molecular formulas. But what's also pointed out when their paper is that as you increase the molecular mass uh, accuracy going from 10 ppm down to 0 0.1 ppm, or if you improve your understanding of the isotope abundance, you can very, very quickly narrow down the number of possible formulas from hundreds down to just one. So that's a very powerful filter and, and can be very useful in identifying compounds. And this is just illustrating how mass plus the isotope abundance gave exactly the right formula for this compound. Now it doesn't give you the structure, but it said, you know, given this very, very large molecular weight, which could be you know, potentially many, many things, because there is accurate isotope abundance information, and because the mass accuracy, not great, but still good enough, um, was able to, to come up with this precise formula, which matched the compound. So I think when you're searching through databases, it's important to think of a few things. So the PubChem database, as I said, is, is kind of useless for metabolomics unless you can confirm the hit is a metabolite which then means having to check against a metabolite database, which is sort of two steps. Um, KEBI um, includes a lot of biological compounds, but it's not restricted to any species. So it has metabolites from anything, as long as it's alive. METLIN originally used to be a human metabolome database, but it now is expanded into all kinds of plants and insects, and so there's no origin. You don't know what these compounds are from. So a lot of people, and I'm seeing papers where people submit or have, you know, they, I ran Metlin, I got my hits, and I was running on, on, you know, mice or rats, and they get hits to all kinds of human drugs. And the mice and rats are not on human drugs. It's because they're not worrying about the origin of, of, of what the hits are. Um, same sort of thing if you're doing plant metabolomics and you're getting all kinds of human drugs. Um, that's not right. Uh, NIST has lots of pollutants and uh, uh, non-biological uh, compounds, so those also have to be considered. So make sure you think about the organism and the source, and if you can use organism-specific databases, generally your hits will be much more robust and accurate. So we see that NMR is quantitative, GCMS can be quantitative, MS generally is not. Most studies are uh, not absolutely quantitative. They will give relative measures. To get absolute quantitation, you actually need isotopic standards. You need deuterium, carbon, or nitrogen-15 labeled standards. And you also have to have standards that are either the same or very similar to the target chemical that you're working with. So to do that, you use what's called single reaction monitoring or multiple reaction monitoring, SRM or MRM. Has anyone ever done SRM or MRM? Three, four, five, six. So that allows you to get quantification. And again, it's using a compound that's appropriately labeled. Um, it's selecting for that compound or its uh, fragments. And when you have those fragments, you can then compare the peaks and peak intensities. And because you know exactly how much you've added in terms of that isotopically labeled standard, you can get precise uh, quantitation by measuring the area under the curve. So it's something that you can do manually, and it's a fair bit of work, or there are now automatic or semi-automatic ways of doing that. And so one of the best ones is a kit produced by a company called Biocrates, where they have created and have all of these isotopic standards. And it allows you to measure anywhere from 160 to 180 different compounds and get the absolute quantitation. And they have other kits for measuring bile acids, and I think there's another one coming out for steroids.
Um, and there's a trend now in, in many other organizations to start creating kits to do uh, quantitation via mass spec. And if you ran a kit, say, on urine, this is what you typically would see. Um, with concentration of metabolites and um, um, compounds identified. And you can see with the, the remarkable sensitivity you get with MS, getting concentration ranges from 10 nanomolar to 7 millimolar, so a 10 to the 6 fold difference in concentration. So if, if you do things right with mass spectrometry with LCMS, you can get levels of quantitation and identification that are better than GCMS and they're better than NMR. But it's a lot of work. And, and if you don't do it right, you can get some pretty um, bad results. And, and I just want to emphasize that. that there's, there's too many uh, MS-based metabolomic studies that are appearing that were just not being carefully done. Um, so don't be um, lax or, or careless with, with analyzing MS-MS data. Okay, I think we're about due for lunch, actually. Um,